Bay is one of my favorite companies because they are really walking the walk. They are not perfect, but they are taking leadership across all the sectors they're engaged in to really transform at all levels their sourcing, their communications with consumers, their financing, and Jonathan's going to tell you a bit about that. They're also doing a lot around mindful living and engagement with consumers, uh, which, which I find very exciting because I think not many companies are there yet and Unilever is really leading the way. And, and just to show um, what I know, like how Unilever is kind of in my fiber, I can recite to you that their CEO, Paul Pullman, made a commitment to double their business while having their environmental footprint, while doing 100% sustainable sourcing, while bringing half a million small producers on to their supply chain. How is that? <laughs> um, but fabulous. So Jonathan um, also has run a communications firm where he worked on cocoa and coffee, labor practices and social practices globally. Before that, he was in craft, where I met him there, working on sustainable um, sourcing and engagement for that company. Uh, really a terrific guy and a lot of expertise and look forward to hearing his talk. So thank you. Thank you, Tansi. And uh, as she said, my name is Jonathan. I'm at Unilever. I've been at Unilever three years. Anybody in the room know what Unilever makes? Just throw out a brand or throw out something that you think we make. Dove? Anything else? Ben and Jerry's, Axe, Lipton, Magnum. Okay, so it's okay. So. You, Basically, I just want to enunciate one of the challenges that we have as Unilever in the United States is not very well known as, as, a, as a corporate holding company, but we, we have a number of brands. Some of them have been recited here, and that's part of our challenge. Before I start, let me just say thank you. Thank you to Tansi for the invite. A titan, a true titan in the industry of cocoa, sustainable sourcing, unbelievable leadership at an NGO like Rainforest Alliance. If you're looking for a job, I'd suggest look there. Kip Walk, an old friend from previous Coco days, thank you for being here. City for, for sponsoring and bringing all these wonderful people together. Um, I thought I'd just give you maybe 10 minutes off the cuff here and then open it up to questions and dialogue, if that's cool with you. Um, but to give you a sense of what we're really trying to do at Unilever, why I left Vermont uh, three years ago, I was living in a co-housing community, uh, consulting to the cocoa industry with no intention of ever going back to corporate America and um, got the call from Unilever to come down and talk and, and really thought that it was my best opportunity to make the biggest difference. And so, as Tansi said, we have a, uh, a very clear vision uh, for, corporate, for our corporation, which is to double our business while decoupling environmental impacts while at the same time increasing social impact. Sounds like a lot of words. What you really need to know about Unilever is it's our belief that, it's, that corporations are going to be required to change the way that they behave. The way that they behave, the way that we behave, the way that we actually interact with the world, the way we interact with NGOs, the way we interact with governments, the way we interact with co consumers. The old way is not going to get it done. It's not going to be two or three companies, five companies, ten companies that, that are actually going to drive big change. It's going to take lots of corporations lots of you know, students like you, activists like you, that will come along into business to kind of change the narrative. And so at Unilever, you know, we have this big vision. We have a very simple purpose, and that is to make sustainable living commonplace. In other words, we need to mainstream this conversation and do it fast and at scale. This is not about Unilever trying to be Whole Foods. This is not about us trying to be the most philanthropic company with the best foundation. Uh, you know, we're not a charitable organization. For us, this is a, actually a required behavior uh, for the way forward in the world that we live in. So to us, it's all about growth. It's about taking costs out of our business. It's about reducing risk. And I think a lot of you folks are in finance uh, probably understand risk or do understand risk a lot better than I do. And it's about ultimately building a reputation for a company that ultimately leads to consumers wanting to buy things from us. Um, it, it's a fairly simple model, although it's, it's quite difficult to pull together. Uh, as we go forward. So having said all of that, you, you know, a couple, a couple key thoughts. One is around brands with a purpose. And so Unilever has a portfolio, if you can believe it, of 400 brands or so. We operate in 180 countries around the world. We have 180,000 employees. Um, 
And what we're trying to do is now drive this, this idea that each one of our brands, one by one, starting with the top 20 that are billion dollar brands individually, will embed within the brand proposition what the ambition of the brand is. So in other words, what role will this brand, what role will Dove play in society addressing societal issues that, that in fact are core to the brand? It's a, it's, a, it's a big thought, it's a difficult kind of exercise that we're going through, but one by one we are going into these brands and saying, you need to either stand for something big in society or ultimately we're gonna sell you. I mean, that's, I'm just getting really blunt with you guys, but that's the way it really works. Uh, we're not interested in brands that are playing in kind of a commoditized space where it's all about price. We think that brands are required in this new world order that we live in to stand for something bigger. So Dove is about, about you know, beauty and confidence and particularly around young girls and in, in body image and self-confidence. And that is really working, which is why Dove is one of our fastest growing brands. Ben & Jerry's is about social justice and that's why it's the fastest growing ice cream brand in the entire portfolio of Unilever. Uh, that's why we're doing in thing like Life Boy, which is a soap that went on for, was doing great things for all these years and then finally got linked to this idea about children. Five million children around the world are not reaching the age of five because they're dying from diarrhea, which is preventable if they would simply wash their hands. So we've, established, we, we, we've tied our soap brand directly to a societal issue that's important and guess what? The number of deaths is coming down and the brand is, is growing. We think that's the model uh, at least for Unilever, that's the model that is going to be able to differentiate us in this VUCA world that we live in. VUCA being volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Things are moving very rapidly, politically, economically, socially, so we need to keep moving with our brands in society. Um, so for the finance folks, and I, are, are all of you finance folks? Pretty much? No, not all finance. How many are in finance? How many are in something? Throw out another thing that you're, that, besides finance. Marketing. Marketing. Information. Is information systems. So I, w I was speaking just prior to this. One of the things that's interesting is that, that we, have a, we have a strong thought here that brands with a purpose grow faster. The hardest part about brands with a purpose grow faster is actually enunciating that clearly in economic terms. How do I, how do I prove to the world that Dove actually grows faster because it has a social purpose? And we need to do that not only in one brand, but hopefully we're going to do it in 400 one day. And so how do you, t how do you actually make that, that story come together, hold up, and move on? And so it includes the marketers, it includes the IT people, it includes the finance people, all trying to come together to kind of push this. So that's brands of the purpose for now, and we can talk more about that. The other thing I just wanted to mention was that, that, that we, we are very much focused on building a movement and want to be at the forefront and a catalyzer around building a movement for sustainable growth. A movement, you know, a movement around this entire narrative that I'm trying to present to you around brands with a purpose and standing for something more in society and decoupling environmental impacts. We think we can do this. We're not gonna do it alone. Again, it's gonna take very, very interesting and uncommon collaborations with NGOs, with governments to kind of pull this together. But to give you a sense, we're building a movement internally amongst our employees. It has to start there. Employees at Unilever are you know, at various places in their own journey, but we spend a lot of time with employees talking about personal purpose. Personal purpose, not the Unilever purpose, personal purpose. And we get, once we get to that, then, we, then we, we usually find out that if you can get to the personal purpose of somebody, you can then link that to a brand. You can, you can then use that to leverage our, our overall conversation internally. So we'll start internally. But one of the things that's interesting is on, on Wednesday of this week, I was in California, uh, at an event called We Day. We Day is uh, what I would like to think is our, the movement of our time. There were 19,000 kids between the ages of 13 and 17 at the SAP Center in San Jose, California, and Unilever is working very closely with a charity called Free the Children. And, and, it, and it's all about creating this energy for youth activists at 13 to 17, who will then ultimately be probably sitting in the seats you're sitting in in a couple of years. And then how do we follow them into net impact in the chapters of net impact? Then how do we follow them into Enactus? And then how do we ultimately follow them into One Young World, where they're in roles and then they come back? How do we start to close, the, close this all together and create this ecosystem? Because as Kip, Tansi, and I probably all have to acknowledge, it's not going to be the three of us or anybody our age that's ultimately going to change the story here in a dramatic way. It's going to be you, right? I got a nine-year-old son that's counting on you 
to kind of make a big difference now. We're, we're at a very tricky part of the world. The story is, is, is evolving, digital, you know, I'm not a digital guy, so no IT questions, please. But how do we create this movement of people that are like-minded, that, that have a personal purpose, have a personal passion, can bring that into an organization, whether it be Unilever or it be Blommer or it be Rainforest Alliance or wherever it is, how do we get people charged up, hardwired to come in and say, I want to be a part of something big. I think the world, the world is going to require that in, in order for us to move together. So we're looking at how we build this ecosystem of activists, right? From 13 years old or younger, all the way up through college, all the way up to their first job in, in, a, in, a, in a company, all the way up into a mid-career job. How do we get people together to say, you know, we want something different for, the, for future generations? We don't want to scare anybody. We, we, we understand, and Tansi understands probably better than most, that scaring people into doing the right thing never works. How do we inspire people to get into the conversation in whatever function they're in? So a little bit on the, on the soapbox, but we were out there in California with, the, with these 19,000 kids. All 19,000 kids, you cannot buy a ticket to the event. All 19,000 kids have done a local and a global activation that's changing the world, right? So they're all there, and it's a one day of inspiration. And they had Mia Farrow there, and Marley Matlin was there, and some environmentalists were there, and there's some other people there. And, and the point is, these kids are lit up like Christmas trees. They are ready to roll. Uh, they don't have any limitation. They have nothing in their head says that I'm, they're limited. There is, there's nothing holding them back. And I think the question is, how can we not only not hold them back, but get them into, into, into great places, whether it be universities, colleges, jobs, where they can make the biggest difference? And so to loop it all back and then I'll, and then I'll stop is, is, you know, when I, when I left Vermont and, and came to New Jersey to work for Unilever, you know, I really had that thought about legacy. I thought about if I was going to make the biggest difference in my life and in the world, where would I go? I went to Unilever. I chose Unilever. Unilever is not the only company in this space by a long shot. There are lots of people doing lots of great things. How do we bring all this together and celebrate what I think is a great future if we decide that we want to play? If we decide that we, we've had enough of kind of the, the same old game um, and that we want to do something big and different. You know, talk about different. Also in California when I was there was that Walmart, I don't know if you've seen the new thing from Walmart, but Walmart has now announced a sustainable, sustainability leaders shop within their Walmart.com where you can actually filter by buying from companies that are badged as being sustainability leaders. It's a first step. It's not perfect. We don't, don't get too worked up about Walmart or any, any other company, but I think what, what, what the idea is is that we're taking a lot of the data that, that we've been collecting about companies and their activities, and we're now trying that, that step now to get them it, into the consumer space. You know, you know, if we do a lot of great things and consumers don't buy it, then we really haven't gotten all the way there. So how do we unlock the consumer? This is a great first step. Uh, that's ultimately my challenge at Unilever. Our challenge at Unilever is how do we take the great work that Tansi's doing with Rainforest Alliance at source, put the frog on our pack, and then help consumers to understand what that frog stands for and why they should pick that product versus another product. Sounds somewhat simple. It's, it's pretty hard. And so we've got lots of work to be done in that area. We need folks of your age and talent to kind of help us with this consumer unlock because it's not there yet. It's a long way from being there. So anything else from me, I wonder? Um, I, think I'll, I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, one other thought, because I, I, I do want to address the conversation about are we hiring? Yes, we are. <laughs> yes, we are. NYU is a, is, a, is a key recruiting school for us, so that's, that's exciting. But just a word of advice, and then, and then I'll take whatever questions or thoughts you might have. The word of advice I would have for you is, do not limit yourself to what impact you can have on an organization based on what you think your skills are or where you get hired within an organization. If you come into the finance organization, Unilever, and you think you're going to be counting the dollars and doing the P&L work, you probably will. But if, you, if that's all you ever do at Unilever, that's not enough. We need people to come into the organization, people like me that come in that, that are new and are courageous and ambitious enough to say, I want something different. I, I'm, I'm wondering about this and what about that and how do we measure this? You know, we're going through this exercise now about how to, how to measure climate change financially. This is very complicated stuff. How, do we, how are we going to figure out the renewable energy target I just set for our United States business? We're going to be 100 percent renewable by 2020, and I have no clue how we're getting there, and I have no, no clue on the, on the accounting on it. And so what I'm suggesting is that if you come into marketing, how are you going to come in and make a difference in, in, a, in a brand 
and try to help discover what is at the core of that brand proposition. We're not making up the, you know, the purpose for each brand. We're actually trying to figure out through granular work within the Consumer Insights, what's the driver? You know, Dove Men's Plus Care, Men's Plus Care, the big insight that was unlocked three, week, three months ago was that most men, most dads, believe they're bad. 90% of men think that they're not good dads. So what we did, and, and the insight was, that's not what the kids think. So, the, so, the, so this gap between 90% of guys think they're, they're not very good dads, and yet the kids think they're un, their dad is the, is the best thing ever. How do you connect that and make it really powerful? And I don't know if you saw our Super Bowl ad, but you know, this, this idea about how we're trying to connect this social purpose, celebrating dads is, is kind of the campaign. So how can we do this and replicate this across our entire portfolio and make it relevant in society and, and have someone say, there's that you, there's that, there's that frog from Rainforest Alliance, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to have, that's a preference for me. I'm going to buy from them because they're on the path to doing the right thing. They are doing the right thing. They're in the right conversation. That's, that's the holy grail. I can get, you see the you, you see the frog. I'm buying that because th that stands for something that I want to be a part of. And with that, I'll stop and, and take any questions or comments anybody has. Uh, hi, thank you so much for speaking with us. I just have a question about the uh, brand image you were talking about. Obviously, we know that Dove is trying to cultivate a positive body image for girls, but on the other hand, some other brands in your portfolio, I mean, we've all seen the Axe ads. Yep. They might be, let's say, doing the opposite of that. Yep. And there's also rumors that um, Dove sells skin bleachers in Indian yep. for girls who want to be more uh, white. So for us students, I guess, um, we listen to all these rhetoric about uh, corporate social responsibility, also you want to do these nice things, but to what extent is that really the core philosophy that you follow along throughout all your brands, and to what extent is it just a marketing gimmick? Thank you. You, you know, I thought it was gonna be a nice easy lunch, right? <laughs> Th thanks, Tansi, for, um, for the invite. Well, we, we just finished eating, so I thought it'd be a nice question to ask after lunch. No, I, no I, 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 that, that's exactly the kind of question that, that we at Unilever need to address, right? So do we have, are, are we all the way there yet? No. I think that you'll begin to see Axe starting to reposition itself in different ways. The consumer demographic on Dove and, and on Axe is different. Um, the, 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 the whitening that you're talking about, uh, Fair and Lovely, is, is sold in India. There are, there are some that, as you suggest, you know, how can that be compatible with with the, US, with the sustainable living plan. We think it's compatible because we, it's also about health and well-being, it's also about body image, and, and, and therefore we think it has a place in our portfolio. So we might be disagreeing slightly about the representation. It is not a marketing gimmick. It, it will be a marketing gimmick if, if the, brand's, the brand ambitions, and Axe does not have a clearly enunciated one yet. Uh, they're not one of the ones that are, that's done. So they're in, the, they're, they're in the process of still working it out, as is fair and lovely. But for the ones that are done, they are, they are, they are really well done, and they're, and they're at the core of the proposition. So I, I take your point. But here's another, here's, and I don't know whether you were offended by this or not, but, but you know, on climate change, we, we, I don't know if you ever, did anybody see the Axe Shower Pooling campaign that we ran? Some of you did, some of you didn't. But you know, this idea about cl climate change is a kind of a complicated, very difficult story. And you know, Axe is obviously this, this, the demographic is what, 15 to 24 year old males. How do we connect with people of that age around an important issue like climate change? So we came up with a campaign called Axe Shower Pooling. And Axe Shower Pooling's message was, it, was, it, it talked about water, it talked about climate change, but the, but the key thing was save water, shower with a friend or stranger. Now some people, you know, I, I got a lot of heat on that saying, you know, that, that's a little bit offensive. I guess, the, I guess this goes to the corporate communications part of it a little bit more, which is basically, I think that we have to be very thoughtful as, as organizations about what demographic we're trying to reach. And for the demographic we were trying to reach, that, that tested extremely well and did very well. And the campaign around Axe Shower Pooling was 17 universities across the United States where we took that campaign on campus, starting at USC, Arizona, Tennessee, the big schools, 60,000 plus. I had 15,000 students there in the climate change conversation as the result of a campaign that what I find is kind of the older demographic, i.e. me, thought it was offensive. For them, they thought it was absolutely relevant and it actually drew them into the conversation. And so, you know, 
this is tricky space, right? This is a, but this is, this is kind of why I, I'm really urging you to kind of bring your whole self into the conversation as you look for jobs and go into organizations about how do, we, how do we connect? How do we connect with people that are really interested in these issues that don't want to be scared? You know, if I scare you enough, you'll do the right thing? Never. That, that you know, if I send out corporate messages and you say, well, that's that same old thing, challenge, the question was great because it was challenging. That's, what I like is dialogue, constant dialogue between us and, and, and folks on the outside of Unilever saying, I don't buy that, or I buy that, or could you modify that, or what about this? That's what I think we need more of. I just don't see, I don't feel and see enough of it, quite honestly. So that's why I like coming here, and then the first question at lunch is, here we go. <laughs> it's all good though, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, hi, uh, I'm Terry. So I didn't have a question, but then once he spoke, uh, I did. So. I, I really just don't like the idea of that product, um, the fair and lovely, because lovely. that just, it's, it's just basically saying if you are light skin, that's better. And I understand the whole, um, you're trying to do the body image kind of thing, but wouldn't it be better if you, like Dove, right, which is like celebrate who you are as you are, and I love the Dove ads, those are my favorite. Uh -huh. um, I'm I'm just in general like struggling with the idea of how you can have these two brands that ha like show totally different messages and one is actually really racially charged which annoys me so I don't know like what your thoughts are on that. You, you know I'll be honest I had I I've, I've had some level of trouble with it myself. Um so I went and did research and in, in fact I I think I was saying it I was at, I was at Stern at Jeffrey Hollander's class not too long ago. And this question came up, and, and, and I was a little bit taken back because I hadn't been asked the question before. I didn't even know what the product was nine months ago because we don't sell it here, and it's not, it doesn't get a lot of prominence. And so I went back and started asking the, the same question you're asking. And what I'm told is, is that um, the consumer insight and the, and the conversation with the consumers that actually use it is that they want to have the choice to use it, that they want to they have the ability. Who am I to say that they shouldn't be able to use it why not, why not offer the, the opportunity to use it um, based on whatever circumstance that they're in? That's as best I can do for you. I mean, I hear you. I, I, I hear the comments about Axe and, and, and you know, the way it's been positioned uh, overall. S some folks think that it's this. Some, some folks think it's this. I think it's just one of those things, quite honestly. But I will, t I, I, I will tell you this. I will take it under advisement. I will take it back because I, I think it's a very important conversation. Um, it came up again yesterday because we, I don't know if you saw this hashtag speak beautiful thing that we're running online which is all about that most most tweets are about negative self body image and that we're now we're now pushing out tweets back saying you're you're actually beautiful. Um, and it came up in that context like who is Dove to be telling us about speak beautiful when when in fact you make acts and you make fair and lovely. So I want to leave it at that, and, and, and you know, if you want to talk to me afterwards, I can come back to you and, and provide more context if that's helpful. But yeah, this is not like an attack on like you. It's no, just no, like no, something no. to like think about. No, no, I, yeah, no yeah. I understand. I mean, you, you know, it's cool you're thinking th about that, it. That's one prominent example, but you know, I, I, there are, there are others. There, there are others. How, how how can you have certain ice cream brands in your portfolio, and you have Ben and Jerry's in your portfolio, and how come all brands in, in the ice cream portfolio are not acting like Ben and Jerry's? There's consumer demographics. There's different cohorts of people. Consumers are asking for different things. I mean, I'd like to believe that all consumers are asking for a Rainforest Line certified product. I want to get to that day when, the fr when, when we don't need the frog because everything is, right? But until that time, we, we, need, we have a lot of work to do to, to talk about what are the benefits of, that, of the frog? What are the benefits of doing this work in, in some of these communities? Can we get to a place where we're not gonna, there's not going to be a price premium? Can we get to a place where this is just mainstreamed? that these conversations are just mainstream, it's, it's automatic, if you will, so that we can then move the bar to the next place, which is even higher, right? I'm talking about doing sustainable sourcing in the United States. I want to get to regenerative, right? I, I, want, I, want, I don't want to put anything on, anything, on, on the ground. I want to be able to have this all be, I take the animal manure, I compost, I put that back on the farm, and it's just a, one, big, one big system. Mm -hmm. But that's a step a little further out here. I'm here right now, I, I'm on this journey, and, and that's kind of the way we're looking at our whole business is we're on these journeys, we're willing to set these targets, we're willing to go after them, 
and we definitely want the input from folks like you to say, when, when we're a little off, or when there's a question about the journey, let's talk. Yeah, that's cool, I like that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> there was one over here, I think. Maybe not. Oh, hi. Um, so for a lot of social impact thing that Unilever does, you mentioned um, a lot of cause marketing side of it. And then for the panel, we were talking a lot about the supply chain side right. of it. How has Unilever um, changed in terms of the supply, ch supply chain? Yeah, so the, I'll get to the supply chain, but just right. one word. on we, d we don't consider it to be cause. I don't, want, I, I don't want to leave you with this idea that it's simply, I, I call my agency in New York and they come up with a really cool idea and I somehow attach it to the brand. That, that to me would be, you know, completely not what we're trying to do. We're, we're basing these brand purposes on relevant insights related to the brand. So if it's Domesto's toilet bowl cleaner, it, it's not going to be, they're going to be for breast cancer. It's going to be Domesto's brand purpose is all about the fact that millions and millions of people are suffering through lack of sanitation, lack of hygiene, i.e. lack of toilets. So if I can somehow build out more toilets and we have a target at Unilever that we're gonna help put 25 million toilets into the world by 2020, if I can somehow do that, guess what? If there are more toilets, I got the toilet bowl cleaner, I win, the world wins. <coughs> you follow the logic? So, th so the hard work on the brand down, down is to find that same insight brand by brand. Suave is a, is, a hair, is a shampoo in the United States primarily. It's a lower income consumer and there's, and there's work, it's not done yet, but there's work going on right now about the women who use Suave are a certain demographic economically, but they're very socially, they're very socially connected to each other. They're, they're in the same kind of life state, if you will. One of the insights that's coming out is many of these women are struggling with budgeting. Can we somehow link a women's empowerment program on suave hair care, believe it or not, with women who are in the same kind of economic strat stratosphere, if you will, around budgeting and, and, and make, that, make that work for them. It's, it's the idea that's being worked on right now, but it's not done yet, but it's coming along. It's, it's that level of granularity because we now know what those women, what's common within the consumers of that brand, and can we address it? On the supply chain, I will tell you this, we, we are a big buyer of many, many commodities. We, we have done life cycle assessments across our entire supply chain. We know which ones are, are in the focus area for us, and it's, and it's basically palm oil, soy, cocoa, tea. We don't just go out and, you know, so we're very focused on our top commodities. We're very focused on the women's empowerment story related to the commodities. I was listening to the loan conversation in there, and, and I'm glad that that conversation is going on because I think it's the right one within Unilever about how do we get these micro loans out and get more support at the, at the base. But it comes down to the it, a understanding what's in the supply chain, which is what, where Tansi and Rainforest Lines comes in. They help us understand what's going on at the ground, what's needed, what are the gaps, and how do we work together to make that happen, right? But across all of these supply chains, and we have many, you, you know, I don't know how many supply chains we're in, but hundreds with hundreds of thousands of suppliers and so how do you make the biggest difference we've chosen to go with the biggest commodities first we're not afraid when they're hard um, but what I did in the United States that is hard that's even harder than I thought it would be is much of our work at Unilever has been focused on smallholder farmers in Asia in Africa and elsewhere tea palm oil cocoa we wanted to do the same mentality in the US context our number, one, our number one commodity in the United States is soybeans that goes into our Hellman's mayonnaise and spreads business. A year and a half ago, we started a conversation with farmers in Iowa. And you know, I was looking at this video, Tansi, that you put together, and, and I've had that same experience where you walk on in, into the Ivory Coast or Ghana and you say to the farmer, do you know what this is? And you hold up a chocolate bar and they don't know what you're talking about. So here's the person growing it, but they've never seen the end product. I thought that was kind of unique to Africa until I went to Iowa. So there I am talking to the Iowa farmer, soybean farmer, seventh generation farm, 10,000 acres. He's growing soybeans, and then that comes out, and then the wheat goes in, and then, and then just go you know, back and forth, back and forth. And he said, so why are you here? Who's Unilever? That's always a tough conversation about why are you here? Who are you? And I said, well, I'm the guy that buys all your soybeans. And he said, no, no, you're not the guy. ADM and Cargill, the suppliers are the guys who buy. No, no, I buy from them. But I'm here because I want to connect you 
closer to my brand in Hellman's or in Spreads. And so now for the first time we have this relationship now directly to what I would call industrialized farming in Iowa, Kansas, and Missouri, where we are establishing relationships with our farmers so that we can tie the farmer to the end product. And, and, and so we've just finished, you know, we're, so we started a year and a half ago, we had zero. The way we do it at Unilever is we set targets that, that are audacious and most of the time we don't know how to get there. A year and a half ago we had zero. Three months ago, two months ago, I announced that we'll be at 100% by 2017 on soybeans. And we will just go, go, go. Now we're working on sugar. Now we're working on dairy. We're going right down the line based on how big the commodity is. But again, it's, it's, if you don't know what's going on at, 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 at the, where it's being grown, and you're selling the product over here, you, you're putting yourself a lot at risk. And so we're not doing this again because we're nice people. We're doing this to, to kind of future-proof our business so that we know how the tea's being grown in, in Kenya because Tansi and the group is helping us understand what are the issues and how do we improve that lot for the women and for the, for the growing practices. We're doing it because it's the right thing to do. We're doing it because of women's empowerment. We're doing it because it's good for our brand. But we're doing it also because we're trying to de-risk our business so that we know where the stuff's come from. We know the supply chain's well. And, and we're not putting our entire supply chain at risk as climate change and other things kind of factor in. That, that's kind of the narrative. But we're doing it now in the US. And I'm telling you, it's fascinating. I didn't know that we grew rice. I mean, I, I told you I don't know much of anything. But we don't, I didn't know we grow rice in pretty big quantities in the United States. I didn't know that it was Louisiana. I didn't know that it was Texas. You, you know, I didn't know that the canola in Canada was being grown over here. I didn't know that the pe most of the peas in the world come from Canada and Saskatchewan. We're, we're going supply chain by supply chain right down the line saying, what are the issues? And the issues are all different. You know, if you're close to the equator, you're talking tea and cocoa and, and coffee and some of the other things. When you get out, how are carrots grown? How's, how are the onions grown? And so th the biggest thing is if you go back to the marketing conversation, you look at these things. I'm also trying to educate the marketer to say, if you're working on, on, on the Hellman's brand, your job is not simply put the advertising out there and hope that someone comes. I want every marketer to, say, to, to be asking the questions you were asking in the other room, which is, so what are the ingredients? Where do they come from? What are the issues? How can we address them? How can we build into the consumer proposition? How can, we, how can we help make the consumer care that this is all relevant? Because the consumer is telling me, in survey after survey after survey, they care about where the food comes from. Unfortunately, you know, whatever the number is, 80% of the consumers say they want to know where it comes from. Why are only 20% actually asking for it? So how do I close that gap between what people say they will do and what they actually do? whether it be buying a certified product or buying a non-certified product. And that's how we're trying to do it, is to, cl is to, is to c c you know, create, obviously, relevant programs, relevant communications to get more people into this conversation about how do we change the world for the better and how do we do it through the consumers. Yes, sir. Teacher. Uh, just, thanks. Um, I, I'm, it's been a few years, but I know that when Plowman uh, joined the firm, one of the kind of signature initiatives, so this is the CEO, that he was known for was an approach to uh, management training and development that integrated the arts. I think there was, it's called Catalyst was the name of the program, where people were engaging with the fine arts and using that as a means to kind of develop their capacity to do what you're calling for people to do, think holistically and, and creatively about uh, the future of the firm. Yep. Is that still going on, or if not, maybe you could talk about, again, a little more granular at the level of how you engage your own people in terms of thinking differently about the business and its future? Yeah, so we, um, I don't think that exact program is still in place, but there, there are pieces of it. Um, if you, all of the employees in the organization at some level are, are engaged in this conversation, one. Are they all, completely transformed, if you will, no. What Unilever is doing most recently is kind of at different levels, depending on which group you're in, there are different, there are different trainings and different ways of getting about this. So let me give you an example. Every single vice president and above at Unilever globally goes through one program. Four, so there are 400 of those. And, and it's called the, the Unilever Deve the Leadership Development Program. We spend a week together in groups of 20 or 30 trying to find our personal purpose, working alongside a coach and some other folks where, where we're really not looking for, I want to change the world as a purpose. Can you get down deeper into the insight about what was the crucible moment in your life? I don't know how many of you have thought about the crucible moment in your life when there was a major transformation. And so we go through this really intense work to get beneath the surface of, I want to change the world, to 
what's, what's really deep in. So my, my personal purpose, to give an example, was through this exercise, which relates to Kip and Tansi, actually, is to help the lost be found. The transformational moment I had in my life in this space was when I was working with cocoa farmers in Ghana and, and, and the Ivory Coast, and I would go into these villages with no electricity, no, no power, and talk to these farmers who had never been to the main road that I just came in on a truck two and a half miles away. They had never been there. They're 65 years old. And yet the, the outside world was saying all these things about the farmers and all these things about the conditions, and yet that, that really wasn't what was happening. And so I became the voice at some level, or I become one of the voices to try to help enunciate what goes on there to, to, to the outside world. I'm doing the same thing within Unilever. I'm putting myself out there as frequently as I can to say, I don't know what your personal purpose is. I know what mine is. I know what gets me out of bed every day. And it's not about selling more stuff. And it's not about you know, working for you know, you know, a big multinational company or getting the next job. To me, this is all about being a transformed individual myself. How do I bring myself into an organization and transform systems? I, I'm not interested personally, quite honestly. I'm not interested in doing little changes for little things. I'm looking at, at, at being a part of something that's changing system, taking system challenges and creating system solutions to them. Whether it's around sustainable sourcing, whether it's around recycling, whatever it is, I want to be a part of the big conversation that says we're going to transform something big. We do that for all the executives. All of the marketers in Unilever go through something called Crafting Brands for Life, which is a, another multi-week adventure to try to create those, those purposes for the brands, but it all starts with the human being. That's the big unlock, I think, at Unilever is, it always seems to come back to the conversation about not corporate training, individual insight and, and, and reflection about what's really going on here. I would like to say that I work with a company that's got 180,000 transformed individuals. Someone will often ask, who's the chief sustainability officer? And we say, everybody. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, on, I'm one of two in the entire sustainability shop in, in the US and Canada. It's not like there's 30 or 40 other people sitting back someplace doing. We want every, every single person, no matter what function they're in, to be a part of the conversation, to bring their, to bring their question, to bring their passion. And, and I, I'm not the arbiter of what their passion needs to be or what your passion should be. All we're saying is be passionate, come join Unilever, get engaged, ask the hard questions, be ambitious about the big creative change, and go for it. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. We were discussing a couple of us at the end of one of the panels about how, now I'll phrase it the way I tend to think of it, that when a large corporation is creating a premium brand that is, you know, sourced sustainably, they're, they're actually off-sourcing their ethical decision to the consumer who is willing and able to pay the extra dollar or whatever. But I take it that Unilever is doing exactly the opposite of that. I'll take the example of Suave Shampoo, which is probably the opposite of a premium brand. You're saying that all the, let's say, palm or other tropical oils that will go into that, for that budget brand, that will be everything in there, the ideal is to have it sustainably sourced? You need to come work with us. Okay. That, that's you. exactly the enunciation I'm trying you, to make. You hear, you hear the disbelief in my voice. Yeah. yeah I guess. So what 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 I want to tell you is that it's our belief that that if this whole conversation about sustainability or sustainable sourcing or brands of the purpose always ends with the conversation that you, we're going to charge you more for that and all that, we don't think that that's a sustainable model. And so our model is based on I'm going to give you all those benefits. You're going to count on me at Unilever to do that hard work for you, working with others. So I'm going to do all the background work for you. When you see the you, I, will, I have your best interest in mind, but I'm not going to charge you extra. So if I, if I, if I pay a premium, if, if Tansi charges me a premium, I'm not going to flow that through to the consumer. I'm going to, I'm going to eat that because, because our belief is the more we scale with Tansi and others, the price will come down anyway. The product is better. The ingredients are better, but we're going to build it into the price. And so we're doing it across, across, I'm doing all the soybean work. There are premiums involved, but it's not showing up at retail. But what I'm hoping I'm giving you is the assurance that, you may, you may not have known the soybean story, but giving you the assurance that soybeans is only one ingredient, I'm going to be on a mission to do all ingredients. And I'm going to give you that assurance that we're looking after you. We know who the farmers are. We know the practices. Are they perfect? They are absolutely not perfect. 
But every single farmer in Iowa and Kansas and Missouri is on a very, you know, the classic continuous improvement model, which is this is where they started. This is the improvement they made year one. They have to stay on the, co the, the continuous improvement ladder at Unilever or they drop off. Or they drop off and we, and we go somewhere else. So that's, that's the proposition that we're making to you. We don't think, we think that the, the longer we keep this into it, the green is premium or you pay more. The longer that story kind of perpetuates, the, the fewer number of people that are actually going to use the, are going to consume their products. So we want to mainstream it, price, availability, easy to understand the information. I think we have a big job to be done in terms of communication and take, taking the story from the Ivory Coast or Ghana and helping people to understand what is this story? What does sustainability actually mean? And why should it matter for me as a mother or father or, or whatever? Why, wh why does it matter? That's the, that's the mission we're on. I think we're out of time, so okay. let's give Jonathan a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next, we're going to get Kip Walk to come up. And most of you by now should have some chocolate in front of you. Kip is going to take us through and uh, chocolate tasting and explain a little bit more what you would be thinking about when you were going to a chocolate tasting and some of the flavors that, that are in the chocolate in front of you. And then Christine will be doing the same with us with the, with the coffee. And uh, Jonathan, great conversation. Uh, as Jonathan said, he and I have known each other for a number of years, and it's, uh, it's been a while since we saw each other, and it's always inspirational hearing his uh, love and, and, and uh, drive for these issues uh, now across segments, which is, which is tremendous. So to kind of get to a little bit more of the fun side of, of chocolate, we talked about yield earlier today. We talked about financing the farmers, all critical aspects of, of, of keeping this supply chain viable. But one of the key areas that obviously we, as you saw in the film, we take these pods and then we convert them to chocolate. Now, one of the biggest obstacles or challenges we have within this industry is unlike other foods that you eat, chocolate really is a personal choice. You may like Snickers or M&Ms or a Hershey bar. You may like chocolate in general, but it is that comfort food. There are things that you really look for when you choose chocolate. So quality is always paramount. We can do everything the right way at the, throughout the supply chain, but if we provide you a product that doesn't taste good, guess what? It all collapses. So sustainable has got to be seen as all the way through the supply chain to you as the consumer to make sure that this is what I want. You continue to look for it and buy it. That makes the whole supply chain work. Now, similar to what Jonathan had mentioned within the sustainability culture within Unilever, we do something similar within Blummer, but on quality and flavor. Everyone goes through a tasting class so they understand whether you're on sales r d or you're running one of the machines in the factory what everything is supposed to taste like because quality is paramount and it's required that everyone is vested to make sure we're coming out with a quality product so one of the things that you may see and i, I don't know how easy it will be to see this but we actually work with a flavor wheel Similar, a lot of you may have seen this with, within wine and some other industries. So we work with a whole range of flavors. Some of them, nutty, floral, butterscotch, all very good. Well, there was the other side too. Petroleum, sulfur, Band-Aids. <laughs> um, all of these things come into play. And we have to make sure that we understand and have a lexicon that all of us, including our customers, when they pick up the phone, they say, well, this tastes like silage, which is something I learned about coming from New York myself. Now being in Pennsylvania, silage is fermented corn that's stuck in a silo. Who knew? But it's on our flavor wheel. So if our customer says, you know, it tastes like silage, we know exactly what they're talking about. And then we can address it. So what we have here is some Rainforest Alliance dark chocolate. It's uh, cocoa beans came from Latin America. And so 
one of the interesting things, like wine and like other foods, chocolate is not just universal chocolate flavor. Different origins have different flavor profiles. And that's important when you're looking to make a chocolate. You can't source everything from one country and make a variety of products that are going to have a wide range of flavors. You're going to have to be much more of a chef to kind of bring in the right formulations to achieve the flavor profile you want. So a lot of you may have already tasted it, but I, I you know, invite you now to take one of the, t the discs and, and, and pop it in your mouth and, and chew it. And chew it pretty good. Let it go around your mouth because your tongue is divided up into different sensory areas and you want your full uh, mouth to uh, feel. Now, one of the first things that we look for is mouthfeel. A lot of times people will ask me, well, what about that chocolate that's really waxy? I eat it, but it just doesn't seem to melt. That's compound, it's not made with cocoa butter. But when you have something that melts nicely, it's smooth and everything, that's generally considered a premium chocolate. Now, anybody want to give me a flavor profile, what they may be tasting? Any kind of flavor? Hopefully not silage. OK. How about something? Coffee. Coffee, possibly. Yep. Tobacco is actually what we consider it. And sometimes that's not a negative. And for those of you, again, when I was in college, it was more commonplace than I'm sure it is today. But chewing tobacco was fairly common. And that having that fresh tobacco flavor was, is, again, not considered a negative. The other thing is, how about brown fruit, raisins, dates, those kind of things, starts to come out generally as you finish the chocolate. That is unique to some of the Latin American cocos. So that is something that we're not, that's not a flavor additive. That's actually a natural flavor profile for some of this cocoa. So, um, I also just wanted, because I know we're tight on time, and I just want to take a, a, an extra minute. We have talked about some very crucial things about cocoa and chocolate, and this obviously being the end product, very important. But for those of you looking to go and forward in what industries you want to look at, the challenges we have in cocoa are far beyond increasing yield within a, a, a family farm structure. As Jonathan and Tons, who's a there, we're talking about areas that have no running water, no electricity, no medical uh, access. We are at the level now where we can come into these communities and really make a step change. So this is not just the chocolate industry saying, you know what, I need more cocoa, so I'm going to be self-serving and increase yield. We're building medical centers. We're building maternity wards, schools. The industry is actively there, and we need people like yourselves to come in with these fresh ideas to make sure we understand how best to do this. Farming is one thing, but changing a community is a whole other challenge, and companies like Unilever, Rainforest Lines, Blummer, and others within our org uh, industry are actively doing that. So I, you know, I invite you to, to, to consider chocolate and cocoa at some point as something beyond just simply uh, a growing a cocoa tree. Okay, so thank you. Okay, so I am I am not a coffee tasting expert. We have uh, folks at Duncan who are, and probably folks in the room. So hopefully, I do not. Uh, get this completely wrong, but let me know if I do. So, um, so you, unfortunately, you don't all have a cup of our delicious Rainforest Alliance dark roast in front of you, but it is available over there. So at the end of the, the um, discussion today, I would invite you to go try that and think about some of the, the remarks I'll make. So when you're tasting coffee, there are two processes. One is cupping, and that's uh, when you're tasting the green coffee to, uh, to ensure that uh, the quality of, the, of that coffee, and that is a, there's a standardized process there uh, so that you're really just isolating the, the quality of that coffee so the roasting might be uh, consistent, but there's a standardized language from, the, from, at, from origin to buyer so you know what you're getting in that green, um, green coffee uh, process. 
and, and the quality that you're getting. What we would be doing today, and what I will invite you to do in a moment, and at the conclusion, is a, a cutting. And that's where you're really tasting the flavor of the coffee. Uh, there's all, well, there's also a standardized language. It's, it's a little bit more subjective. And so what you're looking for are some, some things that are consistent across that are the, the um, acidity uh, and the body. So is it, uh, what, how does it, what, what is that uh, like for, for the coffee that you're tasting? But then you're also looking for things that are more subjective. And we have a coffee wheel, flavor wheel, like the, the chocolate wheel, and you're looking at those different flavors. So um, the product that uh, you've been enjoying today is our Rainforest Alliance Certified Dark Roast. Uh, our flavor concept, let me make sure I get this right, um, was to, uh, to develop a, an easily recognizable dark roast profile uh, without any excessive bitterness. And we feel like we've delivered on that promise. Um, what you'll find, and it's a nice um, pairing to the chocolate that you have, is that it has uh, notes of, of dark chocolate, bittersweet chocolate, and even baker's chocolate. So um, you, might, you might get a little of that carryover from the, from the chocolate that you're enjoying. But if you did not have the chocolate and you have the coffee, then you should hopefully note some of those chocolate, uh, chocolate notes. Uh, it's, it has a very smooth finish. So like I said, we did not want a bitter, a bitter t aftertaste. So it's a nice smooth finish. And it's very full, full bodied and aromatic. So before you take that uh, sip, I would invite you to, to, um, to inhale deeply, perhaps like you would with wine, and enjoy that, enjoy that coffee. Um, the, the other thing that I'll tell you is there are naturally occurring flavors in coffee that do come out. And one of um, my favorites that I've tasted, which was very surprising um, to me anyway, is not someone who's um, strong on the coffee taste, is not a coffee tasting expert, is that the, um, it was a naturally occurring blueberry note. And when you drank that coffee, it had a very strong blueberry note, almost as if the coffee beans had been infused with the flavor when they hadn't. It was a naturally occurring flavor. So, so there's some really interesting ways that coffee profiles can vary, much like chocolate. But again, I would invite you to try that if you haven't already. And if you have, think about those notes of, of uh, chocolate and, uh, and, uh, and having a full-bodied, smooth finish. So thank you. Okay, good afternoon. This <coughs> sort of brings our program to a close. You're invited to get a cup of coffee and come back and enjoy it with chocolate uh, after uh, I finish here. There's a few thank yous I've got to say just to wrap this up. Uh, first of all, it's been a wonderful day and a very, very educational day. Man, professor, I'm supposed to know things. I spent the whole day learning. A great, a great experience for all of us on the faculty and for the students as well. Um, <coughs> in terms of thank yous, I want to start with, she left the room, I think. Uh, <laughs> I tend to, tend to uh, offload my worries, and uh, I do that with my staff. And so Sky Weiss is the administrator of our program uh, our, who's uh, run this whole put up logistics for us and, and made sure that everything worked today. And I wanted to thank you uh, personally and, and, and deeply for all that you've done to make this thing run so smoothly and your staff. So thank you, Sky. <laughs> This, this is the 12th city conference, and so obviously I, I'm thanking City for they've sponsored us through all these years, but also through all these years, my associate director, Rachel Cal, has taken care of all the tough stuff and left me to sort of say a few things at the end. So thank you, Rachel, for all you've done here. <laughs> and of course, I have, have to thank the wonderful folks from Rainforest, uh, Tonsi Whalen, who's been our fellow this year and been, been such a presence here at the school and put this whole, inspired this whole conference for us. Uh, Mary Weather Hardy and Carly Fink, who have uh, been a big players in getting this all working for us and in organizing our, our MBA challenge. Uh, so uh, it's just been a great experience. This has been a wonderful, wonderful city program, and uh, I've had a great time learning from all of you and being part of it myself. So people, get a cup of coffee. And I, have I forgotten anything? I don't think so. So a cup of coffee, a little chocolate. Hey, life is good. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>